Welcome back. It is always a good day when I wake up and I give thanks. And I know that today is a day that I have the deep privilege of introducing you to magnificent human beings on the planet having really unique journeys. And every single person has a story, right? Um, boy, you are going to be so touched and you're going to want to follow this journey once I introduce you to the two guests that I have today. Jesse Bresendine has been on the show with me several times. I absolutely adore him. He is, um, boy, I would just say in a word, a motivational speaker and a brilliant person. And he's really here to help elevate, you know, to help all of us kind of peel back the layers and find out what it is that we have those gifts to share. So I love Jesse. He comes on all the time. Um, and he brought with him the beautiful Amanda Melby. Amanda is here with Jesse today because they're going to share an incredible journey that they are currently having. And so I'm going to introduce you to them. We're going to talk about their campaign, It's Your Time to Shine. And um, I think you're going to be so motivated and so filled with compassion and love for what these two are doing on the planet right now in this moment that you will follow this journey with me. I hope you do. Um, I have been glued to it ever since it started happening. So Jesse Bresendine, welcome. And Amanda, I am so happy to finally meet you. Welcome to the next room. Hi. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for having us here. Let's start at the beginning of when this, you know, started happening. So in May of this year, just a handful of months ago, um, Amanda, who is this beautiful, healthy, vibrant woman, had something happened. So let's start there so we can get the audience up to date. And then we're going to really talk about what we can do collectively on the planet to help you along with anything you may need. Yeah. You want to go first? Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> so I am a ultra endurance athlete and I was training for an event called 29029, which is a hiking event that mimics Mount Everest. And I was feeling really good. I was excited for this year um, and all that it was going to entail. And I started a week before I went to the emergency room, I started to get tiny, tiny headaches, tiny. I mean, they didn't even really register on the map. And um, I was like, oh, it could be allergies. It could be this, it could be that. And I, my, my the last day before I went to the ER or the couple of days before the, I went to the ER, um, I went, or no, it was the day of the ER when I went to you went hiking. hiking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was training, I was feeling really good. And then my leg buckled and I just thought, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm under train. Maybe I need to sleep a little bit more. And I kind of rested for the rest of the day. And then I got off the couch and then I, um, my leg buckled significantly and in every fiber of my being, I knew something was deeply wrong at that point. Wow. And it was just, it was so quick. It was so quick how everything changed. Yeah, it was, it's something too, Jane, from my perspective, you you hear people say things and I'm thinking, well, maybe it's just stress. Amanda's chronically stressed, <laughs> you know, constantly carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders. And we had been talking about you maybe just need to take a break. You need to calm down. You're overdoing it. You're burnout. You're overwhelmed. You're fatigued, which I'm sure a lot of us can relate to. And she had gone to the urgent care a few days prior to this. And that urgent care doctor spent about three minutes with her and essentially confirmed, oh, you're just stressed. Here, take some muscle relaxers and you'll feel better. And she did. And she did to some degree until her leg buckled. And then when we were going to the ER, I was, you know, in my foolishness, taking my book and my highlighter with me, thinking that we're just going to go there. It's just going to be this routine thing. What was different, though, and was really concerning is to Amanda's point about knowing with every fiber of her being, she she cries, but she's not a, 
you know, one of those sobbers sobbing uncontrollably. And prior to going, she was just sobbing uncontrollably to the point of on the way there, she was having a panic attack, even going in, trying to get her inside. She was just, she, she couldn't do it. You know, state would have it. The ER was uh, unusually empty that day. It, you know, I've never been in an ER that was as quiet as that one yeah. was. So we were able to get in right away. She saw from the time we walked through the front door to the time we were sitting down, maybe 30, 40 minutes until she saw the doctor. He started performing a series of tests and everything looks normal from my untrained eye. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great. This is going to confirm stress. It's going to be better. And then he had her stand up and do basically like a heel to toe walk that we might have seen police officers form on people and texting, you know, field sobriety. And when she had a noticeable balance challenge with that, I remember thinking, uh oh, something's seriously wrong. Uh, because the ER was so empty and because it was, he felt there was merit to it, he rushed a MRI order, a CT scan order. And then probably what, about 45 minutes after that, he came back with his initial interpretation, which was that Amanda had a grade four glioblastoma which is a very rare, but also aggressive form of brain cancer. So if you're going to get brain cancer, that's kind of the jackpot lottery of them in terms of <laughs> odds of getting them. You don't want that. You don't want that jackpot. Yeah, you don't want that jackpot. And, you know, so if anything, before we just dive deeper with it, one of the things that we've been really encouraging people through all this is, you know, we are so conditioned, unfortunately, socially to just ignore symptoms, get into symptom suppression. I remember during COVID a few years ago, Amanda was sick. I went to the grocery store to get her some cold medicine because that's what you do. And I remember sitting there looking at that aisle and just having this thought of what in the hell is wrong with us? We have all this stuff is in there to medicate us from masking the symptoms that our body is trying to tell us, hey, something's going on. You need to rest. And what, so what we've really been encouraging people to do from this is if there's something, especially when it comes to that deep knowing that Amanda has, because we do know there's an intelligence within us that will speak often louder than the stories in our head will say, but we just usually don't listen to it, to, to take action and go get checked out. Because I think one of the things that has given us, a, you know, as fortunate of circumstances it can be, is because you listened, yeah. because you honored what was going on, it was able to help us get going much sooner than we would have otherwise. Well, I also feel I um, I had a doctor that listened. I really did. I had a doctor that listened. And it wasn't the first um, like med stop doctor. It was the ER doctor. Um, and he really listened. And um, I, I will say that that made such a huge difference because not only was I feeling seen, I was feeling like, he has my best interest at heart right now. And I, I, I really, um, even though he was definitely the bearer of <laughs> the worst news, he, uh, he was, I, I was very thankful for him. Yeah, you're right. That was, that was a big thing. The doctor, especially going from one who only spent three minutes with her and yeah. dismissed her before to having somebody who is willing to take his time, not rush things and really yeah. value you as a person, yeah. as of just a patient. You know, the things that you have said, your intuition, Amanda, you know, our bodies do have this innate intelligence mm -hmm. and um, we just need to get quiet and listen to them. So Jesse, great point about the medications. It's like, we're always trying to mask what's going on instead mm -hmm. of going, what is going on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What am I feeling? What is happening with the body, mind, spirit here? You know, um, boy, so many things. Okay. So First and foremost, the fact that you are laughing, <laughs> I I just, I literally, I'm getting goosebumps head to toe because here you are, you know, you hit the lottery that you don't want yeah. <laughs> um, and you are able to laugh. Let's talk about, okay, so you get this incredible news, uh, not the news you want. Right. And now here you are. Um it seems to me like you have this beautiful team of healing soldiers surrounding yeah. both of you right now, lifting you up, helping you to find out which way you want to navigate this. And what I do know from following you on Facebook and Jesse, you guys have been posting these great videos called It's It's Your Time to Shine. Um, what I do know is you don't want people 
oh, you poor thing, blah, blah, blah. You know, you want information because that is where, you know, if anybody on the planet is going to beat this thing back, it's going to be you, Amanda. I just know it. I feel it. So let's talk about where you are and what you need um, and what you're doing with it's t- your time to shine. You, you want to start it? <laughs> sure. To, to your point, Jane, first of all, about <clears throat> just the people surrounding us, of which you are one, and you were one of the very early people to throw your hat into the arena and raise your hand and and, and jump on board right away from you know, such a, a place of love. You know, so thank you for that. Because it's um, you know, yes, we're 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 laughing and we're smiling and we laugh way more than we cry, we smile way more than anything else. But holy shit, when you're in those early days of that, it is fucking scary. And I apologize for <laughs> the expression. It's okay. But you know, it is. And so to and and when you're up against something like that, you don't get a tremendous amount of faith from the medical establishment. They have they and Dr. Google have some statistics that they just for whatever reason, have to share with you, does absolutely no benefit whatsoever other than I think for me, and I think probably for you too, but in different ways, it kicks in something else. You know, For Amanda, she, when she initially got the initial interpretation from the ER doctor, she thought she was never leaving the hospital again. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden when they say, no, no, you know, it's it's longer than that. She thought, oh, wait, you have, you know, I have more time. And it kind of flipped a switch for her. Yeah. For me, it was more of this thing of like, you know, how dare you? You know nothing about her and you certainly know nothing about me. How how dare you sit there and try to, you know, put us into some sort of statistical averages, statistics apply to populations, not people. And that's, I think, a really important thing. And unfortunately, going back to what we were just talking about, like that, that rush to medicate, that rush to shut off, um, you know, even our traditional medical model, which was we go to the doctor and they're going to be the foremost authority on everything especially ourselves. Uh, we're very fortunate now. We live, we're alive at a time where information is much more accessible. We can do our own research. We can talk to people. We can use mediums like audiences like you've you've been able to cultivate and nurture, Jane, to reach people from all over the world who have had different experiences and who can come back and say, hey, this isn't necessarily the case. This isn't... Well, well Kelly. Well, yeah. And, and, Amber. And, yeah, <laughs> and we'll, we'll talk, yeah, we'll talk about that too. I okay. think that's really important. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, that's a... That's something that has really transcended now is we don't have to accept, we don't have to accept a statistical opinion and have that become the North Star of what our life will be. Yeah. And we've really, really tried to live, I think, in accordance to that, to the point of where, and surrounding yourself with incredible people, everybody, we've talked about this almost daily, everyone in Amanda's life from friends, family to yeah. just acquaintances got on board really quick with the, this is a healing journey. This isn't a, this isn't a walking the plank out to the crocodile waters, but this is, <laughs> this is a healing journey. And in so doing, you think about the the courage that takes for people to set aside their own fear who love her, who have a vested interest in her and really focus on that. But what in tune it's been is it's been so remarkable because we can feel it's palpable, the love, the prayers, the support, the well wishes coming to us daily. I'll hear her on the phone with friends. She's laughing most of the time because the friends are calling her up and treating her as she's healing, you know, which she, they're not treating her like they're not doing the, oh, how are you? <laughs> no, no, really. How are you? Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Do you have, do you have anything you want to contribute to that? And sometimes too, just so audience knows, I'll ask Amanda questions like that because one of the one of the things that they give you after she's had two brain surgeries to work on this is she still has, and because she just finished radiation treatment a week from basically the date of this recording, <laughs> uh, some of the side effects of that is there's some cognitive deficits that will come back and have already come back, but she sometimes has a harder time remembering certain words or grabbing hold of certain concepts mm-hmm. that might be really easy for us. So sometimes I will ask, yeah. did you have anything you want to add to that? And then that just is a prompt. I, and I will, well, I guess I have or something to talk about this is I never Googled my diagnosis. I had never once Googled it. And honestly, before, so I, I got the news that it was most likely a glioblastoma. I had no idea what that meant, but then I just meditated this 
line, I mean, probably tens of thousands of times. And all I said in the middle of the night, because I was by myself and I was getting ready for the biopsy appointment or figuring out what, what was the next step was, um, what's the best that can happen right now? What's the best thing that can happen right now? And that was something that I, I really just completely fell into. I was like, you know what? Um, no matter how this goes down, what's the best thing that, that can happen? And during that moment, I was like, wait a minute, I know someone with this. And I, I mean, I completely forgot her diagnosis and what exactly it was called, but I would, I just, there was so much that I could glean from her experience. Cause she was, she's almost set or six years ahead of me. And I know her quite well. And I just thought to myself, Holy moly, I know someone with this. And I, it, it was like, okay, I'm in like, I I'm, I'm absolutely in. And then I, oddly enough, someone from my own, my own high school, which my high school was maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe four or 500 people. I mean, it's teeny tiny. And um, a woman that I went to high school with, she's been living with this for 10 years. And I just kind of completely surrounded myself with people that I, that are walking and doing it and doing it well. So, yeah. Wow. I love that that's where your brain took you, is mm -hmm. what is the best thing that can happen right now? Yeah. Um, and, you know, we we can't discount our thoughts because our thoughts do become things. Yeah. You know, it's manifestation and all of that and not even to get woo-woo about it. Yeah. Prayer, yeah. love, all of that energy, because we're just these balls of energy anyway, they all matter. What we mm -hmm. radiate out comes in. Yeah. So good for you. Wow. Yeah. This is this is good, good stuff. <laughs> um, if somebody's listening right now and they're like, oh, I need to find them. How do I follow this journey? Tell us, Jesse, how is the best way to follow along? Because you guys post these videos and I got to tell you, <laughs> I was on the floor. I was laughing so hard at the uh, tampon caddy. <laughs> Um, I could okay. not believe it. And yeah. I thought, I thought, okay, this is a real man right here, right? That was, that was a moment, Jane, I thought was really going to break me. I, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all in on all this. And then when that moment happened, I, uh, uh, this, this might be my limit right here. <laughs> Amazing. How can I, we follow, how can we follow along and see those videos that you're posting? Yeah, it's your so time to shine. We, you can just right now they're under our, both of our social media channels. So just, you can, you can find them there. I will eventually have, and so social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and then I have been putting them on LinkedIn as well as the primary channels, but we're mostly active on Facebook and Instagram, YouTube. I'm switching YouTube where YouTube is going to be pretty much extensively just the focus on the series and what we want to evolve it into. Okay. And then uh, at some point in the very near future, I'll have a dedicated website set up with it too, where it'll be home okay. to all things related to this as well. Good. And I'll make it easy. I'll make it easy for everyone out there. I will post every single link right down below. Awesome. It'll be in the show notes for the podcast and it will be on YouTube and everywhere. So people can just click and go watch. Okay. So it's your time to shine. Where on earth did this come from? This is a good one. Do you want to take it? Yeah, you go. Tell it from your experience. Okay. So from my experience, this is a moment when I'm getting wheeled into the ER room. Um, my blood work was coming back that they didn't know if I had multiple sclerosis. They didn't know if, but they knew something was really kind of going off with my blood work. And I'm getting wheeled into my biopsy and my really good friend who is also a doctor in Santa Barbara, he's just really not one to be like super lighthearted and happy go lucky. He's a really nice guy, but he's just like very monotone sometimes. <laughs> and so, um, unless it's talking about wrestling. Yeah. And then, so I get a text message 
And he says, and he is right before I get wheeled into the surgery, he said, all right, it's your time to shine with like the stars or whatever emojis. And I was like, oh my gosh, like Mike just said something really nice. And so that was the genesis of that situation. And um, clearly my biopsy then revealed glioblastoma, which was not exactly, not great, but- Not the way you want to shine. No, not at all. (laughs) And so that was just kind of the start of it. And it was just funny. It was already kind of funny, like, yeah, here we go. (laughs) That's that's my take. (laughs) When what's really cool about this, Mike, Dr. Lee, who wrote to Amanda, he was the very first person I met when I moved to Santa Barbara as a freshman. He was my resident assistant, the upperclassman who takes care of the freshman and lives in the dorms with him. So he and I have been friends for a number of years. He's one of my best friends still. He is somebody who I just love and have so much respect and admiration for, for him you know, choosing a path in life and sticking with it and just the way he's gone about it. And he'd always wanted to move back to Santa Barbara and pursue practicing medicine there. Obviously, then I'm in contact with him, letting him know what's going on. He's he, And he just happens to be a rehab, rehab doctor. And most of what they do is they do spinal and brain injury rehab. <laughs> when Amanda gets the word that it is glioblastoma, we end up going to University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, up in uh, San Francisco, obviously. And she has an incredible surgery there, a full, what is it called, craniotomy, Mm -hmm. and which in large part, she had an amazing surgeon, an amazing team up there. They're top notch, thankfully one of the top cancer institutions in the US. But again, in large part to Amanda's spirit and determination with this whole thing, the surgeon initially told us that in a six or seven hour procedure, he'd probably keep her awake 60 60 to 90 minutes. He ended up keeping her awake five to six hours of a seven hour procedure because she was so good. And he, he told afterwards when we were waiting to see her, he told myself and her mom that she did quite remarkable, that she's extraordinary and that, you know, some other adjective, wonderful, you know, kind of the same thing, which, you know, you think of a neurosurge, a neurosurgeon, especially mm-hmm. top in their field, they're not ones that probably over mince words, especially offer up three really descriptive adjectives like that. And again, that was very much to because she was so engaged, because she was willing to stay awake, she allowed him yeah. to be able to be more aggressive. One of the problems with that was, is as I mentioned earlier, uh, she has some neurological deficiencies due to the resection. Uh, initially, she wasn't really able to walk much. She didn't have much use of her right side. That's coming back. Mm-hmm. And, and the more she works at it, the more it comes back. We've been really good about that. But she needed to, she was a great candidate to go to rehab. And because Dr. Lee is the rehab doctor, we were able to get her transferred. And so then Dr. Lee, who has been my lifelong friend, I've known him over half my life, one of Amanda's closest friends, warps from going from a friend to becoming a doctor. And you talk about just a strange yeah. full circle moment. We get to the hospital. I come in and sit down. I'm talking with Amanda. She's kind of first time she's been by herself yeah. in a week. And so she's feeling some of the overwhelm of it. She's crying a little bit. I'm sitting down talking with her. Both of us are just exhausted because we've been you know, doing this marathon sprint the last 10 days. And then Dr. Lee comes and sits down across from us as a doctor. Yeah. And, you know, which again, so much love and respect for him because that can't be an easy thing for him to do. He's got his own vested interest in each of us. He's going through his own emotions. He's got his own feelings. And then he just came in and it was, it was really incredible about just outlining what the program was going to entail, that she was going to be there two weeks, what all that was going to be. And she really went to kind of brain boot camp. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. Boot camp. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's your friend, you know, yeah. taking off the friend hat and having to put on the Dr. Lee hat. Yeah. Um, well, that's just incredible that this is a lifelong friend and now he is there to help you move through this. You know, I was thinking too, um, because you're a great candidate for, you know, recovery or rehab, probably due to the fact that you're an athlete, you know, and you have this you probably have that endurance built inside of you and 
that killer instinct of wanting to win. So that's going to play in your favor too. Um, Wow. This is amazing. Okay. So I don't even have questions because I just want you to just keep talking to me about your journey. I will ask you though about, um, there is a GoFundMe page and Mm -hmm. I will put that link in there too. Um, It's just beautiful to see how community can gather around someone in need. Um, And we all know the healthcare system, I mean, it doesn't (laughs) cover everything. Your insurance does not cover everything. I've got a couple crazy, crazy stories about that, but we don't even need to go there. Um, Anyone that is listening to this today, and if they want to go, they can check out that link. And um, if you have the wherewithal, by all means, please donate. So what now? Like how, what do you do when you get up in the morning? What, you know, do you have first thoughts? Are you, you know, you just finished radiation, correct? Yeah. Okay. So So, where are we headed now? Yeah. So right now, my life was a little bit more structured with chemo and radiation because I would take chemo every single day, which was a pill form, which was nice, I guess. And then I, I'm glad that I didn't have to do it in the office and radiation was five days a week. So I have a little bit more free time now. Um, and I have been watching stand up comedians and comedy shows. Yeah. Just, it has been a, like a big, huge laugh fest. Good. <laughs> Good. No, that's, there is all kinds of great research on yeah. that particular thing. Yes. Laugh as much as possible. Do not watch any crap. Don't listen to bad music. Yep. You know, everything needs to incoming is good because your cells are listening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, and I, um, I am trying to exercise a little bit more every day. I would say this past week when I've had a free hall pass to not do anything. I definitely got real lazy real fast. (laughs) Um, But it's interesting that every day, and I attribute this with my whole heart to my friend Kelly, is she said when she was diagnosed, every single day is a gift. Every single day that she is alive, it's a gift. And her husband who um, he was my pastor in San Diego. Um, he's now actually closer to me. Jane's in San Diego too. Oh, he was in San Diego. So he was in Carlsbad and now he's um, now he's in Clovis, California. And even my pastor is like, oh my gosh, I wake up and I'm mad at the Wi-Fi and I'm mad at the traffic and I'm mad at this. And here's my wife, just super happy for another day. And that really stuck with me because he was one of the first people that called me and just said, whatever you need, like, please reach out. And we've been through this. Let me know what you need or, you know, if if we can give you any guidance. And I've really stuck to that. Every day is a gift. Every single day is, I'm just so thankful to be here. And I, I do mean that from the bottom of my heart too because there 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 have probably been years that I didn't even think about like oh here we are again same pattern same this same that and now it's like it there's so like so much more of an intentional day-to-day because when well we've said this before I'm like oh I hope I have x amount of time and then I almost got run over in a car (laughs) on the side of the you know just on our little sidewalk so I'm like yeah who knows when this day or whatever is going to happen but I I will say just really living intentionally and and I think I've said this in a video too some days my intention is to wake up and laugh and eat and then maybe take a nap and that's, that's my day. And I'm fine with that. (laughs) There is nothing wrong with taking a big fat nap. Um, Boy, what a great, what a great perspective. I mean, Mm -hmm. we all need this. None of us have a lock on whatever this moment is. It is here. 
and then boom, it is gone. And I do really appreciate you talking about living intentionally because it doesn't matter what diagnosis or what prognosis or whatever is happening on the planet. Each of us needs to be in a state of gratitude oh. all the time. That's that's my that's my wheelhouse. And I know Jesse from following you on you've got a couple different pages. Um, you post these beautiful memes that just talk about this very thing. Like every day, I'm like, oh, what's he going to do today? And it really is about being in the moment and about loving what it is the mm-hmm. people around you and surrounding yourself with, with good people. Um, what a ton of courage you have, Amanda. <laughs> I mean, I'm just sitting here and, and you are just so beautiful and such a bright light and um, willing to share what you're going through yeah. is really amazing. So thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank thank you, you. so much for being willing to come on and, and tell the story because I wasn't sure, you know, cause some people are very private and they don't want to blast it all over the place. But um, I think this is really key because through what you and Jesse are doing, you're really helping us to not just have education over what you're going through, but to really live intentionally. Yeah. I mean, if people don't listen to this show and walk away and go, wow, I just found a penny on the ground. Yay. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> what it's all about. Oof, I am just so grateful. Jean, you know what you're saying too. I think there's, there's just something to add to that. And what Amanda was saying about waking up and, and my intention is just to watch some shows and laugh. Mm-hmm. You know, I think one of the things, at least kind of in the, my long-term goal with hopefully all this is we can really challenge some of the societal norms that have long overextended their welcome. And that is that we need to be go, 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 do, do, do all the time. We're human beings, not human doings. And we spend so much of our lives obsessively pursuing stuff and things, but for what purpose and to what ends. And, and that's the thing that really is such a tragedy in all this is, is because like Amanda said, you know, we play with this idea of, you know, the only thing that's changed for us is that somebody's put a stopwatch and tried to put a timer over us. And so it's visibly ticking. No, we're, to. we're actively resetting that. Right. <laughs> Good. But the truth of it is, is that all of us have one over our head at some point, and it could be walking down the street, the sidewalk, the car jumps up. We've all had those encounters, yet so many of us treat our lives like they're infinite rather than how finite and precious they truly are. So we really hope that we can start to challenge some of those things, that enoughness is not about how much stuff or how successful you get or your titles. It's really about being able to be content with your moments about allowing your, not who you are or what you do to define you, but really allowing the quality of your experience to be something and be that, be, have that be sufficient enough. And I think to that end, it's something that we're really hoping to have more and more conversations about that because it's just, it's all so fragile. It's all so precious and our lives are far too precious to expend so many of them. Yeah out of a state of gratitude, being stressed off, being upset about the traffic, being frustrated, (laughs) blaming this, you know, whatever it is, as opposed to really just recognizing that, gosh, what really matters most is what's right in front of you. And and that you've been gifted this moment, that you've been gifted the opportunity to draw breath and make that, make that moment into something substantial, whatever substantial is for you. But as long as it's meaningful, Mm -hmm. right? right? It's not about always doing, it's about more being. And I think one of the things that we've done fairly well is we've been better at being, you know, mm-hmm. really, really being, you know, taking this, Amanda, especially taking it a day at a time. Yes. I tend to do more future planning than her, which is great. Like, I think that's part of my role in this is I can anticipate those things, but for you to really just be present. Yeah. And I, that, that is like, every, every, like, again, every day is a gift and every day that I wake up is I'm so, so thankful for it. I, you know, uh, it's just, it's incredible how things can change so fast. So this morning you were a little grumpy when you woke up, <laughs> weren't you? Let's be honest, Amanda. <laughs> Somebody woke up on the wrong side of the bed for five minutes. I just wanted to sleep a little bit later. I don't have to oh. be awake yet. <laughs> oh, you two are the best. This is so beautiful. I'm just, um, I'm just in 
really a state of amazement. Um, you know, Jesse, to your point about we're human beings, not human doings, and about collecting stuff, you know, we're just like, I owe, I owe, off to work I go. Really? You know, you get to the end of whatever it is, however you're blessed to live, whatever length it may be. Some have very short lives, some live really long. Um, but, you know, it isn't about collecting crap. It is about uh, being in a state of love and gratitude with these wonderful relationships that you can have and in the laughter that you can have. Um, do you want to talk about death cleaning? <laughs> okay. I was, First. I was ready for that. Not like I was ready for this one, but I was like, Oh wait, I, I have something to talk about on this one. Let it well, rip. this is huge because, um, <laughs> First of all, just you could tell us what it is, because yeah. I think some people are like, what? Man, like, that oh, sounds she's... horrible. That sounds so negative. <laughs> and so let's say what it is. And yeah. then let's talk about your journey with death cleaning. Yeah. So death cleaning was, so I finally got out of cottage rehab. I, you know, I've been there for two weeks. I had just gotten out of surgery two weeks before that at UCSF. And there was just like it was like unfinished business. So I was like, I don't want to die with all this stuff in my house. I am not going to leave this to Jesse and my mom and my roommate. So I, for about two and a half days, threw away more than 50%, I mean, may say 75% of my stuff. I was like, I don't need any of this. I don't, I don't want to take it with me. I don't want people to have to clean up after me. And so I got rid of most things. Cause I mean, my closet, I'm like, I haven't worn that in how long or this book. I'm like, I don't really need to read this. <laughs> like, so, so about the motivation of stuff too. Oh, you were saying there's, she had these, these printed pamphlets from some of the like motivational courses <laughs> she had taken and she picks them up. She's like, I don't need to be motivated anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need this anymore. <laughs> And so oh. I just really got rid of so much stuff. And I, I did like get, gave it to Goodwill and, you know, I, I sent it that way, but I taught or I asked a few of my girlfriends, I said, here's some stuff and whatever you don't want, I'm giving to Goodwill. And I just, it was so cathartic and it was almost like this realization is like, holy moly. I just got home. I'm now in my own house. I was given X amount of time to live. And I, there was part of me that's like, I, I want to get rid of all of most of this. And I only want to see like family and friends. And like, it became so apparent that quality time was going to be way more important than any anything physical that I had, any memento, any, any, anything. I think, uh, yeah. To, you know, to that point, there is this moment, Jane, that's, I think one of the more special moments, and there's been a lot of special moments in our journey of special moments. This one really stood out. It was the night after Amanda's biopsy. And so this would have been May 21st, which is a Tuesday she so they ended up keeping her an extra day because when the doctor gave her his prognosis her vital sp spiked because she went in kind of a state of shock <laughs> understandably so and at one point he goes oh i'm not sure why your vitals are acting this way and you know, <laughs> <laughs> how, the, you know how the f would you feel <laughs> just but i had i had gone and i think i was just calling people or whatever it was but i walked back in her room and she was sitting up in her hospital bed and she had her mom or dad or sister, her, I think her niece or nephew, and two of her closest friends sitting around her. And she's sitting up in the bed and she's, I mean, I kid you not, glowing, like really glowing. And as cliche as this is, this was truly a butterfly emerging from the cocoon moment. And that she's sitting there and it was like you saw this person who for so long had carried the weight of the world on her shoulder who had been so worn down and burdened with the stress of life, 
this the the drama the unnecessary crap the you know self-loathing self-deprecating and, and not even in a fun way just in a kind of a mean way the the hardships of the past just holding on to so many things the people pleasing many of the things that many of us struggle with on a daily basis and that we hold on to probably far too long something yeah. else that we get all death clean <laughs> uh, which we you know can talk a little bit about the mental and emotional death cleaning too but she's sitting up in bed and she says something to her friends, as she's glowing, she said, you know, so much of my life, I've spent so much of my life comparing myself to others, almost in a demeaning way, stressing out because I didn't have as nice a house or didn't have as nice a car, didn't have as nice a clothes as other people. And I realize now how kind of what a waste of time all that is, you know, how silly that all is. And what really matters most is the people in this room. And, and Amanda said many times throughout this, and as people have you know, throwing their hat into their ring to support and to follow along and to be a, an advocate, a supporter, a, on Team Amanda type thing. She said, one thing I've done really well my whole life is I've collected good people. Yeah. And she's done that by being nice. She's, I don't know why all these people, why all these people want to pay attention to what I have to say. She said, all I ever did was be nice. And I've often told her, well, Amanda, nice is enough. And in a society that, a society in our world that prioritizes stuff, over substance prioritizes titles over morality that prioritizes wealth over you know true emotional abundance you know being nice is enough yeah boy it is and you can see that i mean the support that you have garnered uh through the gofundme and the people that are following your journey with it's your time to shine and the videos that you guys are posting um boy nice is enough yeah. Nice is enough. It's like we we just let's just be kind. Yes. There's just enough crap on the planet. Yes. Do we have to add to it with being a pain in the ass? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, we do not. Right. So this right. is uh man, I love it. Now I'm like uh, as you were talking about your death cleaning, I'm laughing. I'm like the motivational <laughs> thing gets me, but um it's time. I think everyone could benefit by doing a little death cleaning. Right. Let's, you know, let's get rid of the crap that we have. Yeah. We all collect stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Wow. That's a lot of stuff. I bet you felt free and emotionally too, probably unburdened. Did you yeah. go of any negative friendships or, or do you not have any negative, you know, people, negative Nellies in your life? Because I find those to be incredibly draining. Yeah. It's like, uh, no, 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 no. Don't bring your crap to me. I do not want it. I don't have the bandwidth to hang on yes. to your crap. Okay. Yeah. That that's come that has come from well intended friendships and um family members in the sense of I had made peace with kind of each step along the way. I knew I was going to do chemotherapy and radiation that I know. And I, I know some people who do this without it and by all means that that's their journey. And, um, I will say a lot of, there's a couple people that really are like, I don't think you're doing the right thing. I don't think this, I don't, I'm just, you know, I have to really just hear it with a grain, like with a grain of salt of, I love you dearly. And I'm going to agree to disagree with you on this one. And I know that you have, you know, a really special place in my heart, but on this topic in particular, trust me, I, I'm making this the right decision that I feel like I can for myself. And that's going to be different from everybody else. But I, I think that there has been like some hard conversations or I don't pick up the phone as much or I kind of have to be a little bit guarded right now. Okay. And and again, it, it does come from a well-meaning place, but it's it's not where I am right now. Absolutely. But, yeah. This is this is your journey, you know, yeah. and you can't have somebody raining on this parade. <laughs> this is not what you need. Um, I want to be mindful of time because I know you have a doctor's appointment. Um, so I would like final thoughts from both of you before we say goodbye to the audience. You go first. You want me to go first? Yes, just in case. <laughs> Gosh, final thoughts. Anything. 
you can ask for things. You can tell us what you're all about. It, anything at all that you want to share, Jesse, you've got the floor. I, I make, so I make a percentage of my income every year from doing professional speaking. And I've joked throughout this, that I rarely ever find myself as a loss for a word because I'm, people look to me to have something to say, but I find myself often speechless throughout this because I've, I, I'm in a state of awe of how you, Amanda, have have really embraced this, how you have transformed through this, but also just the people who have who have jumped to the place to jump up to, and again, Jane, you being one of the early ones to do it, who just got in right away and said, "Yes, you know, that's something I want to be a part of. This is something I want to do." And so I guess I'll, I'll, what I'll say for my final thought is, is this, and this is still a very early forming in its infancy, infancy thought. So if we have a conversation three months, six months from now, I might have a little bit more perspective or gone to a greater depth of it than I have yet. I've always been absolutely fascinated by the story of the World War I ceasefire. It, in the early days of World War I, on the Western Front, you had the two opposing factions on the opposite sides, and especially in no man's land, which was this horribly unhospitable part of the European countryside that had been just bombarded and torn up. And you had people in trench warfare that were most of the time, maybe 50 feet apart from each other. And kind of the way trench warfare worked is somebody sneaks out to try to kill somebody else and you either kill or get killed or somebody blows a whistle and everybody runs out and you maybe make it to their side or you get mowed down by the other side. But on Christmas Eve in 1914, you know, they somebody made the announcement, asked, "Would you come to the? Would you come outside and join me for celebrating Christmas?" So that soldier sets down their weapons and walks out there. Now, keep in mind, these are people who are just killing each other, trained to kill each other. And so you think about the courage that took. On the other side, then somebody else decides to go out there and meet them and do the same. Again, the courage it takes, you're having to trust in the human more than the narrative of why we should kill them. And eventually you have the trenches emptying out and people coming together, shaking hands, sharing, exchanging Christmas well wishes, showing photos of their families, talking about their families at home. And the soldiers quickly learn that, wow, wait, you just want your family to be safe and healthy? Well, I just want my family to be safe and healthy. You're not this demon. You're not this horrible entity. Uh, why am I trying to kill you when you are more alike me than different? And what you found after that experience is that in many parts of uh, throughout the war, in some areas, it went on for six months. Soldiers didn't want to go back to kill each other. They, they had humans over there. They wouldn't want to kill this guy anymore. And so they would get orders, to shoot each other. And someone would call out, we have to shoot a volley. So we're going to aim high, duck down low. And then eventually what got them to start killing again was not their desire to kill one another. It was that the generals and the politicians on their own side would threaten them with basically treason. If you don't start killing those people, we're going to kill you. And then what are you to do? And I, I've thought about that so often and, it's, and even more so through this as you know, we, we declared the war on cancer. President Nixon declared the war on cancer in the 1970s. And since then, we've gone to war. We've been we've we've adopted slogans like fuck cancer, kill it, all these kinds of things. But what's really interesting, Jane, is when you start to study some of the people who have gone into remission, or even you look at this little brief glimpse of our story, which is only you know three and a half months long right now. I think that those soldiers back in 1914 were really onto something, that there is a better path than war. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time, there was only maybe tens of thousands of people who had died in World War I that ended up going and costing the casualties, I think there was like 16 million dead and another 20 plus million injured. So he, and that was that to choose to do choose something greater than war. I, I think that's love. And I think that so many of these healing journeys that I've studied from other people, you start to hear about the different things they did. And you realize, my goodness, the things that all these things have in common is it's really an act of self-love. Even what Amanda just said of, of her choosing, she's always been very clear from day one, utilize the best of what Western medicine has to offer, utilize alternatives, but it's from a place of love and really choosing to love herself. And this is coming from somebody who's a chronic people pleaser. 
who normally allows the, imp- the opinions of other people to dramatically influence what she does and how she lives her life. Yeah. And so it's, I, I really do think for that is maybe it's not so much even about a war on cancer anymore, as much as this is about a call to love ourselves more. Mm. You know, how we treat ourselves, because one thing that is seems to be conclusive in a, in a, in a field of inclu- inconclusivity when Amanda gets this diagnosis, they come out and they say, well, we don't know what causes it. And we don't know why some people are able to outlive the horrible prognosis with it. What seems to be very conclusive is when you start to go and look at some of the behaviors that people do, you start to see all these instances where we're withholding loves from ourselves. We're treating ourselves poorly because of societal pressures, because of um, you know, things that have been normalized for us. There's a whole laundry list that we could do many other shows on. But I really do think that maybe this whole thing is it's it's a call to love. There's there's two cancers, I think, that there is. There's the one that was growing that had a physical manifestation of the tumor. And then there's the behaviors that were being engaged in that may or may not have contributed to it, which we all are are complicit in. And just whether it's food choices we make, whether it's um, how we treat ourselves, how we speak of ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, withholding with love from ourselves and I don't want to go too much down the woo-woo rabbit hole in this whole thing because I know you're being very respectful of our time and now I'm monopolizing it and I want to give Amanda a final thought. <laughs> so I, I, I just will say that this is something that I'm really playing with and I'm, I'm going to continue to explore is, you know, maybe it's not so much about a war on cancer or the fuck cancer thing. Maybe this is really about a call to love ourselves more. Mm-hmm. And hopefully if that does prove to be true through Amanda's healing, she has 100% been a beneficiary of utilizing the best of what Western medicine has to offer. And she has 110% been the beneficiary of learning to lean in and love herself more yeah. in a way she mm-hmm. never has before. Yeah, And that has been what I find myself in constant awe of is not just the Western medicine doing great things, but someone who has been resistant to that for the entire time I've known her seeing her really learn to love and appreciate what an extraordinary human being she is. Mm-hmm. Well, Jesse, that final thought knocked it out of the park. <laughs> and I and I truly do believe that. I am not a fan of the battle or the effort. Yeah. Um, I completely, I have a friend that is on a journey right now, a stage four journey, and um, she prays over her medication. She yeah. too got to take a pill and and it's great. And I pray with her. And, and it's just so beautiful. I actually have a note in here for my friend that I read every day mm. about uh, her cells, her, you know, the yeah. resolution of unwanted cells and yeah. to return to joyous. So it does work. OK, so yeah. you've been listening to uh, Amanda and Jesse on the next room. Amanda, I'm going to let you have the final words of the show. So I will tell my audience um, that I'll post all of the links that and everything that we've talked about. And um, I do want to say one last thing. Please come back on. Anytime the two of you are like, you know what? Let's go have a chat with Jane. Let's just make it a regular thing. I mean, with your schedule, if you want to come on, let's do it. Yeah. Um, so Amanda, final thoughts. Yeah, I I guess I just want to circle back to myself in the room right after I was diagnosed and the mantra of what is the best thing that can happen right now. And I really leaned into that so much so that even when I was being wheeled into surgery at UCSF and I just remember I surrendered completely. I surrendered to the surgeons. I surrendered to the nurses. I surrendered to the staff. I, And I just thought, you know, every ounce of me was like, I feel safe. I feel very safe with these people. And it has been proved time and time again of just like, what is the best case scenario right now? I had one of the best surgeons. I had one of the quickest recoveries. I had such a great time at Cottage Hospital, which is the rehab I've done really well. So if you're doubting yourself or if you're in a in a state where you can just really truly lean into yourself and say, what is the best thing that can happen to me right now? I hope that you can 
answer that multiple times a day because it's been extremely, extremely powerful for me.